Welcome to the Sales Leader Roundtable, a show where we explore, share, and learn about trends in leadership and sales acumen, a place that provides our audience valuable insights, advice, and best practices from trusted members of the sales leadership community. Now, let's welcome Kenley Davenport and Jim DeVold to this episode of the Sales Leader Roundtable. Hey, Jim, welcome to November. Hey, Kenley, I know. Can you believe this? It's already November. I mean, we said last month we got a quarter to close out the year, and now it's a third already gone, right? It is. It's unbelievable. Two months to go. I can't. It's, it's amazing. It really is. And I, and I, I tell you, um, our guests keep getting better and better. I don't know what it is, or I don't know what our secret sauce is, but I keep every month that just gets more and more exciting. It has been amazing. And, you know, part of it, I believe, is just the fact that we've been doing this for a while. The word gets out and it, it's just such a fun platform for us to share information with everybody. It really is. It really is, Jim. So let me take a minute just to welcome everybody to the Sales Leader Roundtable TV and radio broadcast. You know, we're so appreciative of USA Global TV for trusting us with this time slot. We've had a, a good run and a lot of fun with it. And we continue to keep this thing going and, and make the leadership world out there a better place. So what is the Sales Leader Roundtable all about? You know, in our show, we explore topics in leadership and sales acumen with some of the leading thought leaders in this space. Our goal is to bring you actionable and practical information that allows you to immediately grow your team or your leadership skill set. So with that, Jim, um, it's I think we got to get ready and get this show going and get get our guests to get up, get out here and tell us what he's got. Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Paul for everyone. And thanks for that, Kenley. So Paul Fuller, his stated mission is to help others maximize their gifts by using his. Paul has been a pioneer in the sales process and training, sales as a service, content marketing, and CRM. As a previous founder and owner of multiple successful growth organizations in these spaces, Paul has effectively trained and led sales and marketing teams across the world to focus on and achieve dynamic growth. He firmly believes sales is, a defi is defined best in three categories, service, which is helping others get what they need, leadership, which is guiding others toward their vision, and wayfinding, which is navigating the path to success together. He is firmly committed to elevating the sales profession through coaching, leading, and empowering others through systems that enable strong performance. Currently, Paul leads revenue growth at Membrane.com, the top sales effectiveness CRM in the world. Working with his team and a group of over 100 top sales consultant organizations across the globe, they are focused on creating scalable growth through sales excellence in companies and teams in over 80 countries. So without further ado, everyone, Paul Fuller. <laughs> hey, Paul, hey. Welcome, to, welcome to the show, my friend. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm I am honored and uh, I'm, I'm honored. Well, we appreciate it. I know that I've had the chance to interact with you before the today's show and your content is just spectacular. I know we had you out on our Sales Leader Roundtable cohort class and um, the feedback was just phenomenal. Thanks for sending that presentation over and we got that out to all the people participating. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, you got to say, I'm a little bit nervous, actually. You just said the guests are getting better and better and better and better. So that puts me that puts me in a spot that I got to I got to deliver. So, well, yeah, I guess right. we, me and Jim like to put bullseyes on people. That's you know, that's what sales is all about. Right. It's the brutal facts. Um, we are always in the position that we know if we won or lost. Right. That's one of the things about sales. That's right. It's, it's easy. It's an easy metric, right? It really is. It really is. You know, Paul, I'm looking forward to this topic about right, right sizing sales technology for success. I mean, you, you take there's so much going on in tech today, you know, particularly in the sales world from AI to chat GPT, understanding big data or understanding your CRM data and how to leverage it. Um, I'm really looking forward to gaining your experience and perspective on this. Well, I've been in it uh, for, since 2003 now, so 20 going on 20 years, and I've seen a lot of changes, and I think the last five years have seen more acceleration than the first 15, and so, um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating fascinating area for study and absolutely a fascinating area that we got to dive into. 
Well, before Jim kicks off with that first question, um, Paul, I, I just say um, it's just amazing how you talked about 15 years, how much has changed and then how much has really changed in the last five years. So think about the speed of that. The next five years, we're going to see change probably in two and a half years, right? It just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. And, and the unfortunate thing is, as I see out in the world, people are still not embracing it in sales as much as they should. So, Jim, yeah, why don't we get sure. started with some questions to um, Paul today? Yeah, for sure. But, you know, I love the title as well, Ken Lee, and I'm sure there are plenty of sales folks that would be happy to discard some of the technology for better stuff, fewer, better things. But if it said right sizing the sales meeting, I'll bet we would have Dr. Jacqueline's system would crash because everyone would want to know how to right size the sales meeting. So that's a whole um, that's a whole nother topic, isn't it? <laughs> that that it is that it is. So to kick us off, Paul, you know, you, you in your content, you mentioned a lot about how B2B sales is at a crossroads. So help us understand what what you mean by that. That's a great question because I have a really specific definition of that. Um, I think there we're seeing we're seeing the rapid rapid escalation of a number of things in market. And so think of a think of a axis like this going up, and we're looking at the complexity of sales is going up, the speed of operation uh, of, that we're expected to operate is going up, and then just the absolute number of options in the market for everybody and every type of solution is going up massively. Right. But at the same time, we're noticing a down a downtrend. We're seeing downtrends in a number of areas that are absolutely critical to understand and to really dive into. So sales skills, sales skills have actually decreased uh, on an objective measure a lot of across a number of studies over the past 20 years. The ability to develop relationships, um, you know, face to face personal relationships has decreased as a society and whole. Right. And when we live in the Peloton world, it really is us and our riding our bike by ourselves, right? Um, we've it's that relationship development has gone down, and decision making ability across organizations has actually decreased, not in increased, with the advent of technology and the advent of uh, really the the remote worker. So you're seeing that crossroads right there, right? We're expected to do things better, more effectively, and in a more complex area, but with fewer skills. Less, less relationships and with decision makings, makers that are more hesitant than ever to actually pull a trigger. So that's what I mean when we're saying we're at a crossroads. That's a very interesting perspective. And you know, Kenley and I both being in the sales space, uh, it, it, the, the data is very interesting where the client, or I should say the prospect is still looking for that personal relationship yet as you just shared, the data says we're not doing a very good job at doing that. There was a recent study that came out and I think it, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be terrible at citing, citing uh, who it came from unless <clears throat> I look it up, like I'll, I'll look it up specifically. So I make sure I have it, but 32% of people in market see sales as a trusted um, profession. And that is in the B2B markets, they see sales as a trusted profession, but 88% want to buy from a trusted advisor. Now, how does that work, right? So you're going at salespeople are going in at a disadvantage and we, we've known that for years, but it's just increased. Uh, I think it's increased. I have my own you know, hypotheses around why it's increased, uh, but you're going in at the beginning at a disadvantage and you, we need to be able to close that gap, that trust gap faster, not slower. And um, that's, that's something that a lot of salespeople are struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. I have to dive into that a little bit, Paul. This is, I hope I don't take us down the wrong pathway with this question or this, this comment, but you talked about relationship buildings on the downturn, but now we're using AI and all kinds of other lead generation things that are more technology focused, but we're, we're missing the piece. We might be able to put our message out the thousands more people, but we're really not connecting in the right way. So we can learn to connect and build relationships differently in the future than we have in the past. Is that fair? And what are we, what are you seeing and, and feeling about that? Oh, I, I think it's incredibly fair. Um, I'm, I'm a hundred percent against the idea that uh, AI is going to replace salespeople. I think that's uh, nonsensical um, simply by the fact that we, we need to be able to develop, I, I think, 
I think relationships are a key portion of, of uh, sales. Um, what I think AI is extremely good at and people need to get uh, better at leveraging things like that for is that ability to understand the needs and the wants and the pains of our prospects, right? It's incredible at doing, doing a lot of the research that we had to, had to do before on our own. Um, it's incredible at understanding things and understanding concepts. It's an understand. It's wonderful at simplifying things and, and talking about, uh, helping us be incredibly professional. It's not good. Um, well, it may be in the future, but it's not good at replacing a human element and a human relationship. And I think that's, that's critical. Um, so, but those that are leveraging it are actually to go deeper in relationship are doing fantastic. Yeah, I see lots of different tools that are out there, everything from video messaging and other ways to sort of connect with someone in a more personal human way. And then that allows for eventual face to face meetings. You know, I do think I agree with you. I don't think face to face is dead. And, and the only way you build a true trusted relationship is getting to know a person personally. And I do think many of us have gotten to know each other online over the years, you know, particularly since COVID in a much more better way. But um when you're out meeting lots of strangers trying to introduce your product to them, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, organize, so you can have a vertical segment and inside that vertical segment tends to be challenges, similar challenges, but I may have figured out how to do one of them. Somebody else may have figured it out to do a different one of them. And if we don't have a conversation, you don't know if I figured out any of them and I'm not the same as the next guy because I figured out a different one than they did. So I, I don't see how you get rid of that, right? Right. So, Paul, let's jump into some of the technology components in the spirit of your the title of our show today. So another term that you use is the Hydra nature of a technology stack. So what do you mean by that? Well, this was actually found or coined by our founder, uh, founder membrane, George Bruntine. And I, I love it because I love the image, right? Uh, so a Hydra in Greek mythology is you, you cut off one head and, and two come back. And you think of our sales technology stacks. Um, I'm speaking to any sales manager out there that that is like, especially with the advent of AI and those type of things, the advent of all these new technologies. And they're like, well, and their sales reps should come in with, if I only had this, right? If I only had this or and, and this and this, and guess what? And, and there's always, there's been so many ways, uh, and most of the CRMs have, a lot of the CRMs have gone to this idea of they're really more of a platform as a service, right, than, than a sales tool. Um, so there are things that you can attach a lot of different heads to. And after, you know, after that company goes belly up or it doesn't work, then you just chop it off, but two more are going to appear. So I think we've been in that sales, that, that cycle for a long time now. And um, I, the numbers are, are proof that it hasn't helped us increase sales, right? It's it's not something that's made us a uh, truly more effective. Um, and so we get down this this rabbit hole of the next and the next and the next and the next and the next without focusing on the necessary. And so that's what I mean by the hydra of sales tech. It's just it's it's grown in this weird way, fueled by a lot of VC dollars and a lot of I need that I need that. Uh, by sales reps um, without a whole lot of vetting about really why people need things. I love that. And, you know, because it is the why, like, and you mentioned it earlier, what are the pain points? What are the difference? What are the differences in this company versus that company? And we just have to ask the right questions and become that trusted advisor, which is what you were alluding to just a minute ago. It's good Wait. stuff. You know, one of the things I've noticed in some of my own work and looking at some of the different alternatives, as you talked about, Paul, options that are out there, you know, there's so many of them. It's really hard to vet those options because, you know, they're not always, you know, necessarily, they're not expensive, but they're not inexpensive either. And what happens is you start getting three or four things together in order to make this something work. All of a sudden you go, wow, I, I can't afford all of that, right? I just don't have enough bandwidth and medium companies don't have enough bandwidth to do all of those things and so they're always scared to do the wrong thing you know because it's, it's a pretty big investment and then the big corporations you know they have a lot of money in some in some in some ways or have capacity to do stuff but then 
they corporatize the heck out of it and make it not functional because you know they they make it a corporate mandate versus you know this this nimble opera you know assistance that it's supposed mm -hmm. to do what's your thoughts on that well I, you look at just crm look at the heart of where it's come from like where it's gone to right it, crm started as it's Salesforce at the beginning. I was one of the first, I started using it in 2003. So I, I forget exactly when they started, but I loved it. It was great. It was nimble. My sales manager ran it for me, right? He got in and he knew how to administrate it. It was simple. It actually helped me. It was the first thing that actually helped me manage my pipeline really well. Uh, I would be able to prospect well through it. It, it was great. Loved it, right? But what you said there is that the corporatization of, of, of it has happened. So you start to get these, they, they started to go bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, there was no, no secret about what he was trying to do and what they were trying to do at Salesforce. They wanted to get in the IT side. So they get entrenched and just nailed down there. Exactly what happens there is you start to get huge, right? And it becomes impossible to administrate. You have to bring in, there's now whole, there's many, many people that have made a career, uh, me being one of them, being a Salesforce implementer, right? And sales doing a lot of different things. So um, that corporatization has grown. And this is not to knock Salesforce. Like I said, I, I've leveraged that technology for a long time, but you see that in a, in a big way. And so it's not, it, what has happened is it's stripped away the, the functionality of let's help the sales team manage their stuff. And it's gone to let's create a platform that I can now <laughs> force the sales team to enter a ton of data. It's salespeople hate doing that. They they want things that help them focus on the thing, on the skills and the methodologies that are going to get stuff right and they get stuff done, and actually uh, make an argument with somebody to help them, you know, sell more. Well, Paul, that's a great segue to a, to my to another question I have on my mind, and is how should technology play a role in helping B two B sales teams today? So let's transition out. How should they do be doing it? Yeah, I, I could go on a an absolute uh, <laughs> long answer here. So I'm going to need you all to, to to rein me in. But, you know, I went back to that. Let's go back to that crossroads, right? So if we're seeing speed, uh, complexity, uh, all go up. And we're seeing skills relations and decision making go down, right? I think the one thing that we need to do is try and help people develop their skills relationship and the ability to make decisions, at least at a rate of the speed, complexity, and escalation of market, right? So closing that gap, I call it the sales technology confusion gap. I'm not going to dive into that, but closing that <laughs> gap, I think those are the things we have to focus on. It's almost like a back to basics. How? What are the things that are going to increase my sales skills and increase them continually? And how do I make them more baked into my every single day so I can keep getting better and better and better, Right. My relationships, how do I develop those relationships? How do I develop those, understand them, dive in, the ability to do that. And that is not sending out a million more messages, right? That is truly how do I develop relationships and decision-making? How can I help people make decisions? So I think you've got to get back to those fundamentals and then evaluate your technology against that. Because if you're not doing those three things, you're not going to keep up. You just are not going to keep up with a million different options that are going to be presented to you. You have to take a a lens and put them through that, you know, is my technology helping me with those things? So Paul, um, a clarifier, you were sharing about technology and then you were also sharing earlier, you made the comment about a salesperson or maybe even a team going, Oh, if I only had that, or, Oh, if I only had that. And we're talking about this degradation of skills and being able to build relationships it almost sounds like we're looking for the silver bullet in technology to do things that quite honestly only a human can do. Is that, am I on the right track there? I am. Uh, yes, you're definitely on the right track. And this is, this comes from, I mean, this is my opinion on the matter. There's, there's many opinions on this as there are people, but um, my opinion is that it goes right back to my concept of what sales is, right? I think sales is is fully about service, leadership, and wayfinding. 
So leadership, that leadership aspect, I think, and if you look at the things that have gone down, the skills, the relationships, the ability to help somebody with a decision making, I think that ties directly to, to leadership. So how can my technology that'll help me functionally do a lot of things, it'll help me functionally do a lot of things. How can that be empower the methodology that helps me become a better sales leader? Right. And how can that be? That should be connected. It shouldn't be in millions of different places, right? I shouldn't have to go to one technology to get myself trained and another technology to manage my pipeline and another technology to, to uh, do my research. Let's, let's simplify, let's bring it down and let's focus on the methodology and building the right methodology within your platform to enable your reps to actually do their job really well. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. So along those lines then, Look, technology is not going to go away, right? If anything, it's just going to continue to grow. Like you said, we get rid of something and two things are going to pop up in its place. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, whether it comes from the actual sales person or sales team, or maybe even more importantly, the sales leader or leaders, what kind of questions should we be asking about the technology before we try to implement or get go get it to implement it? Great. That's a great question. So let me think about that because I, I, I actually do, I have four um, four categories that I think you should look at Okay, and make it really simple. Um, I think the data, I think data is actually really important in the sales technology. So I think you have to make, give data, your technology needs to give you data to make good internal decisions. What I, what I need to stress at a high, high level on this though, is this is not just leadership decisions. If you are giving your salespeople a CRM and saying you have to fill out these seven fields because these seven fields are, what they're really critical is for the management to be able to make the decisions about what the forecast is gonna be, yep. right? If you're giving them that technology, why the hell would they ever use it? Other than, hey, you gotta be on board. You gotta be on the ship. You gotta, you gotta, you know, gotta be a member of the team. Or you're, you're banging them, you know, you're not giving them the carrot. So give them the technology that can actually help them do their job that you could actually pull the data out of. So that's one. Does the technology give you data to make good internal decisions? Does that? that yeah, no, that's a category great. questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just curious, you know, because we're going to, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Assess technology before getting it. I was curious, like, what are some questions that we should be asking ourselves, you know, before we yeah. try to add something to our stack and usable data, certainly, certainly beneficial as opposed to I'm doing it because I have to, to make sure we order enough widgets or that everyone gets to keep their job this month. Jim, I, yep. I like this. It's aligned towards your skill development or the actual things that help them understand their customer better so they can <laughs> close them. Right. I've always said I've always said that CRMs need to be a closing tool, not a management tool. So you just had my my number two and number three. Like, you're reading <laughs> my mind it. there, right? You're reading my mind around the questions you need to be asking around the technology. So the first is, yeah, does this ultimately give you data to make the right decisions? Everywhere from prospecting to account management to to beyond. The second is, does it empower selling skills? Does it actually empower you with the right methodology and I break things down into methodology and then the process is underneath that, but there's a conversation methodology that you need to have. Does it empower that? Um, does it really help a rep with that and close the skills gap? Because I believe there's a skills gap and it's, it's out there, it's documented. And that third, does it give you the ability to manage relationships effectively? If one of the things that's going down is relationship management, <laughs> We should actually be able to provide people with a good buying experience. And I'm not talking about, hey, sales rep, you need to go in there and look at, um, you need to look at the history from, you know, the, the past five years and a long list and Excel list and pull it out and do 19 different things. And if we can't be mapping, we got the technology out there. If we can't be mapping what an account looks like, if we can't be understanding who's a, who plays what role and how they play it and how they feel about us and how it's easy, you know, how they can be buying from us, et cetera. It's not good enough. Right. So we need do, can we truly relationships are getting more complex. So can we truly, it's a question, increase the ability to manage relationships through a technology. I'd say that through any, any technology like AI, AI is a wonderful 
broad technology, how can you use that to help manage relationships more effectively? Um, my fourth one, and I'll I'll step off these these four categories, but this is one that every leader should be asking: is Can I show a distinct return on investment? And and in sales sales technology, that should be actually a lot easier than other technologies. You should be able to track the before and after of of what you have implemented, and the, the tools and systems should allow you to do that within it. Right? It's we're selling. You know, our goal is revenue. So can I truly track revenue before and after I've, I've uh, implemented this and attribute how much of that can I attribute it to the technology? Well, that one seems pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> yeah, it should be. Paul, Paul this, th that comment, that, that little segment of what you just talked about really changed my whole thinking of how I would look at future technology stacks, particularly doing anything. I love that, that it does, that does it give you good data that I can actually improve the clothing of the, can I empower selling skills? Can I uh, manage relationships and can I um, get a return on on this investment and see it all the way through in, in one package? I, it just, it really just re made me rethink a little bit some of what I've been doing in the past. I, mean, I don't think, I think it's very, very insightful. Sweet. Yeah, no, it's, and I don't think it's rocket science. Like I, I, I think we've been featured and functionality to death. Um, when we really need to get down to kind of the brass tacks of what we're trying to do in sales technology, I think we we have we've created you know we've created this this assembly line of sales, uh, and then technology at every level, and then micro niches of that technology and different things. And I think we've we've lost the heart of the matter, which the overarching question there is: Does this help me sell, and does it help a rep sell? That's well, it. That's an unbelievably good segue to um, the next question I wanted to ask, and that's about automation, because now, you know, we see it on our LinkedIn, we see it in our email box, you know, personally, we get it, and we're involved in companies that are doing it, right? So what is this automation all about? How do we handle this principle in B2B, B2B, B2B sales? I mean, it's just, it's, so it seems to be getting, a, I think it's necessary, but it also sometimes feels out of control. Yeah, I, I've seen it uh, from a, a million different perspectives. Well, a million, three <clears throat> different perspectives. Uh, one is a digital marketer. You know, automation was uh, supposed to be the next greatest thing ever, right? And lead scoring. And we could score these leads in emails. And people wouldn't mind automation as long as they, you know, we were only reaching out to them at a time when they had they had uh, the right lead score and all that stuff. And that was a load of baloney. It killed a lot of relationships. It it uh, The best thing it did was give reps a... a someone to target. Um, you know, I, I go back to the, the basics on this as well, right? I think we need to automate the non-human. So what are the things that we can automate? Like there are things that you absolutely can, especially, and you can use AI too, but I mean, you can have a step in your process that pulls in data from, uh, for research, right? That's amazing. Like that would, that would bring that directly to the, the sales rep. You could have a step in a process that schedules a task for a sales rep to, to complete and even sends calendar reminders and that type of stuff. But when we're starting to, to try to automate the relationship piece, I struggle with that these days, especially when I'm a B2B seller. Like you talked about like LinkedIn automation. I I wrote a post the other day on, on this uh and I thought it was a hysterical post because I laugh at just about everything I say. But um, there's, I was like, I, was, I, I like title it, Paul, Paulie, Paul, Paul. So glad I met you. So glad I could see you. I love your work. You know, mm -hmm. you complete, you know, you all get those a million times, right? Because they're all automated. They're all, and you know what? We ignore them. I had an amazing one. I So I, I sent that post out and then I had amazing, uh, message in my inbox come to me the other day that said, Paul, a Paul, Paul. And that was, that was the beginning. And then it said, Hey, I read your LinkedIn profile. I loved that post. Here's the six things that I think, you know, that I, I would love to be able to chat with you about. Here's what I'm doing. And mind if we connect, I was like, amen, brother. Amen. You just, I mean, so there's automate the things that are non-human, but when you start to automate the relationship, I think we we miss in big ways. 
is it fair to think that you could um have templates built in automation so that you can add your own I, I, i'm gonna simplify this but you know you can start out an email that's very personalized to the person you're speaking to based on your research based on any other inner reactions and that's the first sentence for lack of a better simple simplicity but then the rest of the email has already been designed and ready to go right and it's not a very long email but it's designed to get attention and to follow up but it comes across because it is personalized the, the rep is humanizing the um the automation basically if that makes sense well, how do you yeah, react to that? i i react fine to that i think it's better than 99.7 whatever nine percent of the market right um because it, it, gone are the days when i can say you looked at these three things here's a here's a wonderful email to send you as a salesperson and it's just i can pretend i'm a salesperson and and it's you know somebody else uh wrote it for me etc at least i think gone are those days um if you have i would say personalize personalization is is critical in and being able to understand who i'm talking to why i'm talking to them and how I'm talking to them is critical. People put out loads of information about themselves, loads of it. And we don't use any of it in, you know, like we, we use like two things. So use four things instead, right? Use, use basic information on their LinkedIn profile, get it, understand a message, really dive in. Actually, when you, if you say, I love what you do, Tell me what you love about it, you know? So I think there are ways to templatize that type of communication as long as you're forcing a rep to leverage the all the valuable information at their fingertips to personalize it and to actually try and start a relationship. And, you know, to your point, Paul, you can schedule out your posts, which helps you with your time in the future, but the posts themselves are actually personal because you're the one who's writing them as you would communicate, right? And you're trying to make that connection with your ideal audience. So I love that. You got a little of both. So Paul, we're, we're coming close to um, the end of our time. So I have one more primary question for you. It's kind of a long question. So I'm gonna go a little slow because I think it's important uh, to understand where your mind is on this. So of these three things, which do you think are the most is the most important? Hiring the right people, mm -hmm implementing the right technology or empowering teams through great methods and processes see see that's that's not fair that's a trick question <laughs> um uh you know what i there's there is none of those is uh you have to do all three and to compete well you have to do all three really well um, meaning, and they, they overlap so much right now, right? So if your technology doesn't do a good job of helping somebody onboard, uh, if you go out and you spend a bunch of money and you hire somebody and your technology doesn't do a, a really good job at helping somebody onboard and leverage your systems and talent, um, you're missing the boat. And if it's not simple to use, you're missing the boat. Um, if you don't, if you have a great sales methodology, Right. You're using gap selling or you, whatever spin selling, whatever you want to use. And it's amazing. And it's amazing for and your people don't know it and your technology doesn't empower it. You're missing the boat. Um, you can't look at things separately anymore. You can't just say, I'm going to go hire the smartest people and just let them do their thing. Right here. Here's a manual. Go. You go sell. Uh, it doesn't. In my experience, it doesn't work anymore like that. Um, you need to be focusing. There should be. Every time you look at changing any one of those things, how you're bringing on great talent, the talent you're bringing on, the technology that you're leveraging and the methodology, they are one and the same. You, you have to be, be working those three at the same time. I, I love that answer, Paul. I really uh, honestly expected you to say that you need all three because they are definitely interlocked. And I have a soapbox about something you just mentioned about hiring a salesperson and just setting them loose. Here's the product or service you're going to sell. Go for it. I really do believe that sales leaders think that someone with the with sales in their title means they have automatic superpowers and don't need any support. And then they wonder why they fail, regardless of their resume. And 
it goes back to where we we're going this way on skills and training and all that stuff. And it's mind boggling to me, but I love that answer. Didn't you see the S on my chest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul, I know we're getting short on time here. Before we close out with you today, why don't you tell us a little bit about Membrane? I want to give you the chance to tell us a little bit about Membrane and what you do, and then maybe you can close out with how can people find you and reach you to learn more about what you do and, and some of your philosophies and how you might can help them. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. I have the greatest job in the world. I have over 100 partners around that are uh, in sales transformation, sales coaching, fractional CROs. Um, anybody, a lot that are just around elevating the sales profession. Um, they, they focus on really that, that talent aspect and a lot of the methodology stuff. And then membrane is a technology. So we partner with them because that technology allows us to really build in sales processes and methodologies, uh, training directly into a sales optimization platform that also doubles as a CRM, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's one of those technologies that allows you to, it's a S Swedish technology. They're amazing at process. They're amazing at design. It's, it's uh, so much fun to be a part of, but they, you know, lay out prospecting processes, lay out how you want to manage your pipeline, lay out how you want to grow accounts and then actually empower, empower people through that process. So it's, it's a, uh, I, I love it. I get to talk sales all day, uh, every day. And it's a passion of mine. Um, People can reach me pretty easily. It's uh, membrane.com. It's in the chat, but M E M B R A I N.com, like a, uh, as in membrane. Uh, also, I am on LinkedIn. I uh, post a lot. Um, please go ahead and connect with me. You're happy to, uh, i pretty open, pretty open connector as, as long as you uh, take a second to, to read the profile, maybe, maybe down past the first line. <laughs> um and yeah that's really that's really it and mm -hmm. i also have a, a podcast that we do on an ongoing basis so you can on spotify it's called the art and science of complex sales i get to interview some amazing people so any of those ways you can get in touch with me and i'll be happy to respond well thank you so much paul we greatly appreciate you being a part of our show and i'm certain that membrane reaches those four categories that you talked about data uh, empowering sales skills, the ability to manage relationships, and then a, a, being able to record that good ROI. That's absolutely. We we worked really hard to do that, and um, did, didn't bring those out for for. Uh, there there was a, a purpose behind those, but but actually, quite honestly, I would put any technology through the lens. I was trying to figure this out, like what what would I, the lenses I would put it and the questions that we must ask. And those are just so at the heart of the matter that if we don't ask them about, especially about membrane, about the stuff that we do, if we don't ask them and they don't help us move forward. Don't do it. Don't just add another piece of tech for tech's sake. Well, I'll let it, I'll let us close on that. And Paul, again, Paul Fuller, thanks for being our guest here in November on the Sales Leader Roundtable TV streaming show. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. You. Yep. It's really great. Well, Jim, that's a, that's a wrap on another show. Whew. I tell you, a lot of really great content, and Paul rose to the occasion. He he right. didn't disappoint, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess he's put the onus now on our next guest. As that's it right. Is. <laughs> the bar continues to rise. The bar continues to rise. Well, you know, our next show, Jim, is on December the 4th. That's the first Monday in December. It's always at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and we got a great guest coming up in Michael Tracy, and there'll be some – promotion on him in the next few weeks, but I'm so excited about having him and thank you for introducing him to our platform. Absolutely. Uh, I'm excited too. I got to hear him speak once before. I'm, I'm excited to hear it again. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jim, that's a wrap on November and I look forward to seeing you in December and um, we'll sign off and say good night to everyone today. Sounds good. Thanks kindly. See you everybody. Thank you for joining us today. You are now eligible to attend the Peer-to-Peer -peer Professional Development Network of the Sales Leader Roundtable. It is held on the fourth Wednesday of each month at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time. For an invitation, email us at info at salesleaderroundtable.com or visit us at www.salesleaderroundtable.com. Our next show is scheduled for the first Monday of each month. We hope you will join us again.